Hello, I'm Simon Whistler. You're watching the Today I Found Our YouTube channel. And in the video today, we're looking at the story of a man who continued fighting World War II for 29 years after it ended because he didn't know it had ended. Hiro Onoda is a Japanese citizen who originally worked at a Chinese trading company. When he was 20 years old, he was called to join the Japanese army. He promptly quit his job and headed off for training in Japan. At a certain point in his training, he was sent to Nakano School to be trained as an Imperial Army Intelligence Officer. In this specialized military intelligence training, he was taught methods of gathering intelligence and how to conduct guerrilla warfare. He was being groomed to go in behind enemy lines and be left with small pockets of soldiers to make life miserable for Japan's enemies and gather intelligence in the process. On December 26, 1944, Anoda was sent to Lubang Island in the Philippines. His orders from his commanding officer, Major Yoshimi Taniguchi, were simple. You are absolutely forbidden to die by your own hand. It may take three years, it may take five, but whatever happens, we'll come back for you. Until then, so long as you have one soldier, you are to continue to lead him. You may have to live on coconuts. If that's the case, live on coconuts. Under no circumstances are you to give up your life voluntarily. Anoda then linked up with Japanese soldiers already on the island. Shortly thereafter, the island was overrun by enemy troops when other officers that were already on the island refused to help fulfill part of the orders that Anoda was given to destroy the harbor and airfield, among other things. This made it easier for Allied forces to conquer the islands, landing on February 28, 1945. Shortly after the island was conquered, the remaining Japanese soldiers split up into small groups of three or four and headed into the jungle. Most of these small groups were quickly killed off. Anoda's group, though, consisting of himself, Yuichi Akatsu, Siochi Shimada, and Kinsichi Kazuka, were not. They continued to use guerrilla warfare tactics to harry the enemy troops as best they could while strictly rationing supplies, including food and ammo, as well as supplementing their small rice rations with bananas, coconuts, and other food from the jungle. Occasionally, they'd also perform raids on local farms when they could manage it. In October 1945, after another cell had killed a cow from a local farm for food, they came across a leaflet from the local islanders to them saying, The war ended on August the 15th come down from the mountains. The few remaining cells discussed this leaflet extensively, but they eventually decided that it was Allied propaganda trying to get them to give themselves up. They felt that there was no way Japan could have lost so quickly since the time when they were deployed. Indeed, this would seem strange to anyone who had no knowledge of the atomic bombs dropped on Hiroshima and Nagasaki. Also, one of the cells had been fired on a few days before, and they felt that this wouldn't have happened if the war was really over. Near the end of that same year, local islanders, fed up with being shot at and raided, got a Boeing B-17 to drop leaflets all over the jungle. These leaflets had the order to surrender printed on them from General Yamashita. The few remaining cells once again scrutinized their leaflets leaflets to try to determine their authenticity. In the end, the wording on the leaflets pertaining to the method with which they would get sent back to Japan seemed fishy to them, largely because the wording made it seem that Japan had lost something they couldn't fathom and which was a big problem in their willingness to accept the war ended. If Japan had won, then they would come and get them, and Japan couldn't lose, so the war must still be going. So once again they believed that it was the Allies, tired of successful guerrilla tactics, trying to trick them into surrender. When this didn't work, more leaflets were dropped, with newspapers from Japan, photographs and letters from the soldiers' families, delegates were even sent from Japan, and went through the jungle speaking over loudspeakers, begging the soldiers to give themselves up. In every case the cells encountered, there was always something suspicious in their minds about the way it was done to cause them to believe it was an elaborate hoax by the Allied troops. Years passed in the jungle, with these four soldiers continuing to perform their sworn duty of harrying the enemy at every opportunity and gathering intelligence as best they could. At a certain point, when most everybody they saw was dressed in civilian clothing, they began thinking that this too was a ruse from the Allied forces to lull the Japanese guerrilla soldiers into a false sense of confidence. They considered the fact that every time they fired on these supposed civilians, shortly thereafter, search parties would arrive hunting them. Over time, they had gradually let their solitude twist their minds into thinking everyone was an enemy, even their own fellow Japanese who would occasionally come to try and find them and get them to come home. These, in their minds, were Japanese prisoners forced to come and lure them away from the safety of the jungle. After about five years in the jungle, Akatsu decided he would surrender, but didn't tell the other three soldiers. So, in 1949, he slipped away from the others and, after six months alone in the jungle, was able to successfully surrender to what he thought were Allied troops. Because of this event, Anoda's cell became even more cautious and went into deeper hiding, and took fewer risks as they viewed Akatsu leaving as a security threat. What if he was captured, they thought. After about five years, another of the small group, Shimada, was killed in a skirmish on the beach of Gontin. Now there are only two, Anoda and Kazuka. 
For about 17 more years, the two lived in the jungle, gathering intelligence as best they could and attacking what they thought were enemy troops whenever they could risk it. They were still convinced that eventually Japan would dispatch more troops and they would then train those soldiers in guerrilla warfare and use the intelligence they had gathered to retake the island. After all, their orders were to stay put and do as they had done until their commanding officer came and got them and their commanding officers had promised to do so no matter what. In October 1972, after 27 years of hiding, Kazuka was killed during a fight with a Filipino patrol. The Japanese had long thought he had already died. They didn't think he could have survived so long in the jungle. But now, when they had Kazuka's body, they began thinking perhaps Inoda was also still alive, even though he had also long since been declared dead. The Japanese then sent a search party to try to find Inoda in the jungle. Unfortunately, he was too good at hiding with 27 years of practice. They could not find him, and Inoda continued his mission. Finally, in 1974, a college student, Nario Suzuki, decided to travel the world. Among his list of things to do on his journey was find a noda, a panda, and the abominable snowman. He traveled to the island and trekked through the jungle for signs of a noda. Shockingly, where literally thousands of others through the last 29 years had failed, Suzuki succeeded. He found a noda's dwelling place and a noda himself. He then proceeded to try to convince a noda to come home with him. A noda refused. His commanding officers had said they would return for him no matter what. He would not surrender nor believe it was over until they returned and ordered him to do so. At this point, he would not have been allowed to simply go home. He would be required to surrender and throw himself on the mercy of the enemy. Over the years, he'd become too successful at using the guerrilla tactics he'd mastered, killing 30 Filipinos and injuring 100 others, as well as destroying various crops and the like for almost three decades. Suzuki then traveled back to Japan with the news that he'd found a noda. Major Taniguchi, now retired and working at a bookstore, was then brought back to the island and to Noda to tell him that Japan had lost the war and he was to give up his weapons and surrender to the Filipinos. As you might expect, after living in the jungle, doing what he thought was his duty, helping Japan, now only turning out to be wasting 29 years of his life, and worse, killing and injuring innocent civilians, it came as a crushing blow to Inoda. He later stated, We really lost the war? How could they have been so sloppy? Suddenly, everything went black. A storm raged inside me. I felt like a fool for having been so tense and cautious on the way here. Worse than that, what have I been doing for all these years? Gradually, the storm subsided, and for the first time, I really understood. My 30 years as a guerrilla fighter for the Japanese army was abruptly finished. This was the end. I pulled back the bolt of my rifle and unloaded the bullets. I eased off the pack that I always carried with me and laid the gun on top of it. Would I really have no more use for this rifle that I had polished and cared for like a baby all these years? Or Kazuka's rifle, which I had hidden in a crevice in the rocks? Had the war really ended 30 years ago? If it had, what had Shimada and Kazuka died for? If what was happening was true, wouldn't it have been better if I had died with them? On March the 10th, 1975, at the age of 52, Anoda, in full uniform that was somehow still immaculately kept, marched out of the jungle and surrendered his samurai sword to the Philippine president, Ferdinand Marcos. Marcos, in a very unpopular move in the Philippines, but immensely celebrated in Japan, pardoned Anoda for his crimes, given that Anoda had thought he was still at war the entire time. Anoda temporarily returned to Japan, but was unhappy that many of the traditional Japanese virtues he cherished, such as patriotism, were virtually non-existent in the culture. Indeed, in his view, Japan now kowtowed to the rest of the world and had lost its pride and sense of itself. So he moved to Brazil and used his back pay to buy himself a ranch there, and he eventually married. However, after reading about a Japanese teenager who had murdered his own parents in 1980, Anoda became even more distressed at the state of his country and young people in Japan. He then returned to Japan in 1984, establishing a nature school for young people where he could teach them various survival techniques and teach them to be more independent and better Japanese citizens. Anoda ultimately lived to the ripe old age of 91, dying on January the 16th, 2014. So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that like button below and don't forget to subscribe if you haven't already for brand new videos just like this every day of the week. Also over there on the right are a couple of other videos that you might enjoy if you enjoyed this one and thank you for watching.